Please take a seat. Come on, guys. George Braley's here from GAMI to talk to us about 100 low lead, 100 unleaded fuel, and the blending and the soil and so on and so forth. They have the first certification. It was announced at Oshkosh this year. George? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am normally not very difficult to understand, even in a big room, but if I get too far away from this microphone, somebody put a hand to an ear, and I'll try and uh, correct that. Um, I gotta tell you, as I started over the weekend to get ready for this event, uh, I gotta tell you, it, uh, it brought back some serious memories from, uh, the youth of a kid that grew up on a farm and a ranch in southeastern Oklahoma. Um, any, I, I think Ken told me there were some people here that at one time worked for Aerostar. Is that correct? What what years did you guys work for Aerostar? Uh, 77 through 80. 70. 70. Okay, and you, sir? What were you doing in 66 at Aerostar? In where, in Northridge? Yeah, in Northridge and then at Van Nuys Airport. And I was the one that, I don't know, building the pressurized 601. So, uh, you worked in that little shop over at the back street at Northridge, California. Yeah. Yes. Were you out of the shop or in the engineering? No, I was in the shop. <laughs> Anybody else? You, sir? Yeah, I was uh, a service here in 1967. We stayed here all the way from Packer uh, in 1987. You started that in Northridge, too? Yep. I was an engineer. <laughs> Talk about a trip that <laughs>
So, uh, I got to be careful what I say because there's some people here that know, uh, will know when I'm fibbing <laughs> or exaggerating. <laughs> um, got to figure out how this thing works here. So, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the first ever high octane unleaded AVE gas that has been approved by the Federal Aviation Administration for use in general aviation spark ignition piston engines. And yes, it is a BFD. And I started this project in the October, late October of 2009. And I can tell you there's been 22 separate individual FAA people that have personally been involved in the project. And about out of that 22, there was about 12 of them that were committed to killing the project at every turn of the event. So let's see, how do I click this thing and make it go on down? There we go. I got it. Okay. Oh, you got a clicker? Oh, that's even better. Pointer. Yeah. I brought my own pointer, but that's a good clicker. So allow me, if you would, uh, 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 to indulge this old guy. I'm not as old as Dick. In, uh, in a bit of nostalgia. Uh, September of 1966, some generous or frankly, probably didn't know what the heck he was doing. Admissions officer uh, allowed this farm kid from southeastern Oklahoma to come through the hallowed gates of this particular ivy-covered installation and uh, let me matriculate as a physics major. Problem was, I was in love with airplanes. And I had gotten my private pilot's license as a senior in high school. I soloed on June the 8th, 1965. And so uh, I got to Brown and as was my habit, uh, I used to trot over to the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Library, otherwise known as The Rock, once a week on the day that a certain magazine hit the shelf over there and I was most generally the first person to open the magazine. Uh, and that magazine, one evening when I opened it up, I found the following. Dick, you recognize that picture? Absolutely. <laughs> and what is that, Dick? That was the first airplane. That was the first airplane that flew. It's parked in the parking lot at Northridge, had to be towed down the street in the middle of the night to get it to Van Nuys. Is that right? <laughs> Two-bladed propeller with the Lycoming IO320 engines on it originally. And uh, so that was appeared in Aviation Week in October of 1966. I'd been at Brown two months at the time. And this was the byline that's under the picture that you can't read. Gulfstream 2 and Aerostar 320 slash 400 to fly soon. And ultimately that happened in a few months after that date. And I could not find the later one, but there was a similar article in Aviation Week that came out in the spring of 67. And I caught it at the library in the same way. And I sat down and uh, typed out a letter and signed it and addressed it to Ted Smith, asking him for a summer job in Northridge, working on the Aerostar, because I thought it was the neatest looking airplane I had ever seen. And this was before anybody had ever heard the term summer intern. But I told him I was real proud of the fact that when I was in the ninth grade, I took a class in drafting and surely I could sit at a table someplace 
and be of some use to replace people that were on vacation during the summer. I got a very nice, polite letter back, not from Ted Smith, but from Ron Smith, his son. And Ron said, George, appreciate your interest, but no, this probably doesn't work for us. Well, I was upset about that, and I was complaining to my old, who was a graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Now, keep in mind, Ted Smith went to Bethany, Oklahoma, to build Aero Commanders uh, in the 1950s and in the early 60s before he retired and went back to California to start the Aerostar Company. And his son, Ron Smith, graduated in engineering school from the University of Oklahoma. So I'm telling my brother my story and crying in my, my cup, and my brother says, baby brother, you write another letter to Ron Smith and tell him that his old fraternity brother told him to... And my brother says, baby brother, you write another letter to Ron Smith and tell him that his old fraternity brother told him to hire my baby brother. <laughs> so the first week in June of 1967, I showed up and found the, the place in Northridge. I frankly was not very impressed and walked in and they gave me a badge and an employee number. And if I recall correctly, I was employee number 35. Now, folks, talk about a wild experience for a 19-year-old kid. I got to drive a car from Providence, Rhode Island, where I was going to school, to Oklahoma, spent 48 hours with my parents, and got back in the car and drove to California on the Mother Road, Route 66, before it became a four-lane. There was about 15 or 20 percent of it that was a four-lane that first year. Showed up out there, and they put me at a drafting table sitting next to Niels Elder. Is that, do I have that right? Anderson. Niels Anderson, that's right. Sorry. And Neil Anderson was generous, took me under his wing, and I didn't know Shinola about what I was really doing. I, I, uh, I could run a drafting machine, and I could more or less draw a straight line. Uh, but uh, I had no idea how airplanes were really built. I had no idea how tooling was made to make the parts to fabricate the airplanes. But the way they had it connected is they had the shop connected to the engineering room, and you could walk through one or two doors and be out on the shop floor, uh, and you got to see all this stuff firsthand up close and personal. And it turned out that one of the guys in the shop was also a flight instructor and had a Cessna 150 that he rented out. And I signed up to get my commercial ticket and uh, my instrument rating. And I found another guy and got a multi-engine rating. And I left California at the end of that summer with uh, uh, a multi-engine commercial uh, and instrument rating and most of the work done for a CFI ticket and by October of that year, I was a flight instructor teaching on Tuesdays and Thursday nights and Saturdays and Sunday afternoon at the Theodore Francis Green Airport, mostly teaching businessmen instruments. And they asked me to come back the next summer, and I did. Now, I started first time, first job I had out there, I think they were paying me 55 cents an hour. Worth every penny, would have done it for free. So that uh, is a really beautiful aircraft. Uh, that's one of the three view drawings that was in Aviation Week that I screen captured and put into this PowerPoint. Um, and that 3D drawing was taped on the filing cabinet that was front of my, in front of my desk next to sitting next with Niels Anderson on my right hand side. Uh, so I went to work and had a spectacular uh, summer and they asked me back and I came back the next summer and by the next summer, I think they had delivered a half a dozen or maybe 10 or 12 Aerostar 600s and they'd already had their first hiccup. The nose gear was collapsing. As I recall, the first one collapsed on the airport at, the, uh, at Love Field. Uh, and so everybody, when I first got there, was in a scramble to try and fix that problem. 
and everybody was starting to talk about a 601 and um, the summer before when I was there, the wings on that first airplane that you saw the picture of were dry wings. And all of a sudden it became a project to turn them into wet wings. And Niels Anderson sitting on my right, you cannot imagine this being done in engineering today, especially without CAD tools. He started in and redid the drawings for a set of wings that was out in the shop and supervised taking them apart, sealing everything and putting them back together again and making wet wings out of them. That was the first set of wet wings. And I was helping him at every turn of the, of the screw because he was staying busy and working late and working after hours to do that. And I think from start to finish, from the first time they drilled out a rivet until they put it back together and pressure tested it to see if it held water, was less than 14 days. I mean, that's just almost inconceivable in today's engineering world. So the third summer I was there, somebody put me over working on the pressurization system. Uh, and I think that's because everybody there was afraid of thermodynamics. <laughs> and I had, uh, had just recently uh, finished uh, two or three semesters of thermodynamics in engineering school. And so I started working on that, and as I was doing it, they were busily making the fuselage ready to be pressurized. And somebody had one of those fuselages out in that test cell trying to blow up that fuselage with, with water or air or styrofoam and air, I've forgotten what. Uh, and I was working on some of the systems for that. But in the process, I realized that in order to pressurize that fuselage that is not round, we, Dick, you had to put a ton of uh, doubler frames in that fuselage to stop the bending moments from when that fuselage would bend. Now, in my wildest imagination, as I was watching that happen, it occurred to me that the one thing somebody might have done different if they'd thought about it a little bit further ahead of time would have meant to make the fuselage round instead of oval because they could have knocked 150 pounds of weight off that thing uh, that had to be put in there to keep the oval. Have you ever seen an oval balloon? <laughs> Every balloon you've ever seen is pretty much round. It may be round and long, uh, but it's pretty much round. It's, it's really easy to contain the loads if they're all in tension, but it gets a whole lot harder and fatigue gets to be a much bigger problem if they're not. And in addition, it would have been one heck of a lot more comfortable, <laughs> especially for my generation. So that's my trip down nostalgia lane. So let's talk about fuel. Pardon? Pardon? Because there would have been about five inches more elbow room and about uh, uh, two inches more head room. The, the, if you took the same vertical dimension and then made it round, the elbow room would have gone up by four or five inches across the, across the fuselage. Unleaded Avgas, coming soon to an airport near you. Um, this was a scene at our airport uh, about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, we were unloading components to make about a 10,000 gallon batch to do the very last test the FAA has asked us to do. Uh, and uh, I want to recognize AvFuel. They, uh, they took a deep breath and did the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, and you always have to admire that. Uh, about a year ago, they decided after they had done a very thorough investigation of our certification project, that they wanted to uh, help facilitate the distribution, the production and distribution. The guy that owns AFUEL is Craig Sincock. He's one of my heroes. 
Uh, he started that business. Avfield delivers 40% of all the jet fuel and have gas delivered in North America. 40%. Whoa, yeah, 40%. Craig Sancock started that business driving a fuel truck. Yeah. He one of my heroes. So Craig got an enormous amount of very vitriolic pushback from the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, in particular their leader, Pete Bunce, but also from Lycoming and a couple of others. And at one point, Pete Bunce got in Craig's face, as Craig tells the story, and said, Craig, have you gone crazy? Why in the world are you working with those guys down in Oklahoma? You need to be working with the PAFI project. Those guys are trying to do an SDC. That'll never work. Craig Sincock's response to Pete Bunce was the following. Well, Pete, the reason that I decided to do that is because I investigated the fuel and the fuel simply works. Period, parade rest. Every fuel that went into the PAFI program, if you knew anything about fuel chemistry before it went in there, it was doomed to fail. I mean, I, it's just almost stunning that they managed to spend $80 million of your taxpayer dollars to prove that fuel chemistries don't work, that any good fuel chemist would have known before they went to the PAFI program. So here's a, uh, a difficult subject matter. Uh, about 10 or 12 days ago, uh, uh, or two weeks ago this Thursday, I did a, a webinar for FBOs for uh, AOPA, and two nights before uh, Pete Bunce uh, made the statement on social flight that he expected the EPA to make an endangerment finding in the next six to 12 months. Do I have your undivided attention? So if it's coming to an airport near you, it's not going to happen a month too soon. Uh, so the next slides I'm going to show you, and only some of you folks in here that have done certification work can maybe appreciate the enormity of this undertaking. Uh, a summary of the uh, FAA's participation in our certification activities. So what you're looking at is a turbo normalized Cirrus SR22 with a high compression 8.7 to 1 uh, IO550N with our STC twin turbos uh, sitting on the ramp in 8 Oklahoma on September 5th, 2012. Um, and two years before we had made the commitment to uh, get the lead out of the gasoline. And uh, as someone has mentioned on July 27th uh, at Oshkosh, the uh, Earl one known as Air, uh, Earl Lawrence, known as Air one, Air dash one and the FAA is the head of all certification. He made the announcement from the Tuesday seminar panel discussion with Pete Bunce present, uh, uh, the president of AOPA and uh, 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 the president of EAA, uh, all four of them on the panel, and, and Air One, Earl Lawrence, made the announcement that the FAA had the Friday before signed off and approved the first ever STCs for a high octane unleaded eighth gas. So as any good engineer should do, at the beginning of the project, we sat down and drew up a set of requirements for what this product should be when we finally finished it. Those requirements included a requirement that the octane be roughly the same as 100 low lead. It absolutely had to be completely fungible with 100 low lead. It had to be able to be mixed in the wing tank of the airplane and in the fuel tank at the FBO and every place in between because otherwise a transition from one fuel to the other would be impossible, practically impossible. Uh, it needed to be able to be produced within, uh, within existing uh, refining and blending facilities. It needed to have a cost at least comparable with 100 low lead. You may not remember, but in 2012, Swiftfield had a seminar at Sun and Fun, and they had some expert refinery guy that had costed out the building of a refinery to make the trimethyl benzene in the swift fuel. And at the end of that, uh, one of my friends who's a, uh, was then still a senior executive at Chevron, but of active pilot 
raised his hand and asked him questions, said, how much is this going to cost? Well, for some reason or other, the guys in the Swiftfield organization hadn't bothered to tell him not to answer that question, and so he did. He said $12 a gallon in 2012. Uh, that was kind of a non-starter. And otherwise, we need the functional equivalent of a fleet-wide all-aircraft, all-engines FAA approval. Now, those were the design requirements. Dick, how'd we do? All right. So we were three years into that certification effort when the FAA started the PAFI program. And they asked us to get into the PAFI program. Matter of fact, they virtually got down on their hands and knees and begged us to do that. And so I had a couple of questions. And one of the questions was, well, if we get in, are we going to get credit for all the certification work that uh, we've already done? And uh, the answer was, no, you got to start over. <laughs> really? Well, I got one more question, Peter White, who was in charge of the PAFI program. If we get into the program, we give you this specification to start with. If a year or two years later, we need to tweak that specification, are we going to be allowed to tweak it? No, you got to back up and start over. That's not how research and development is done, folks. That's crazy. And those two things right there have something to do with why the program was a monstrous failure. Uh, so we weren't going to do those things. So we declined to get into the PAFI program and we continued the STC program. Certain people in the FAA tried to kill the program, including soliciting the president of Lycoming and the president of Continental, Michael Kraft and Rhett Ross, to write personal letters to the administrator, Randy Babbitt, asking Randy Babbitt to kill our project. I'm not kidding you. Jim Inhofe finally got a hold of the letters and gave them to me. Uh, thank you, Jim, wherever you are. Uh, and the result of that was that I did a little research and I realized that one particular guy in the FAA, his name is Mark Remison, had been the author of those letters and had ghostwritten them for Michael Kraft and Rhett Ross at Continental. Uh, I then went in to see the then Air One, predecessor to the current Earl Lawrence Air One. She was a named, lady named Dorinda Baker. Met her on the second Wednesday in 2011 in her office in Washington, D.C., uh, 4.30 after the building was closing. We sat across her conference table, and I showed her the letters, and I showed her a bunch of emails that Mark Remison had circulated around inside the FAA that had many of the same words and phrases that were in those letters sent to Randy Babbitt. And she looked at that, and she says, well, George, I'm kind of concerned about this. And I said, "As well, you should be, uh, Dorenda. She said, what do you want me to do? And I said, I ought to ask you to fire Mark Remison. Mark Remison was a number three guy at the engine propeller directorate, and he was the fuels guru for the FAA. He said, I ought to ask you to fire Mark Remison, but I'm not going to. I just want you to make sure he never works on one of our projects again. And she said, George, I've got a trip scheduled to New Zealand. It's going to be gone for two weeks. But she said, let me look into this, and I will get back to you. I said, thank you very much. And we got up, and we started leaving her conference room, and I was headed for the door, and I looked over my shoulder and said, Dorenda, I got to tell you how happy I am to hear what you just said to me. She looks at me. She's a very bright lady. She looks at me, and she kind of had this quizzical look on her face. She said, George, I sense there's something more behind that comment you just made. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, Dorenda, there is. She said, would you mind sharing with me? And I said, no, I'll be glad to you. Because of what you just told me, and what I perceive to be the sincere level of interest in this matter that you have expressed, I'm going to take a taxi back to my hotel room and uh, I'm going to send an email to the Inspector General of the Department of Transportation and cancel my appointment at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And Dorinda reached out and put her hand on my arm and said, Oh, George, I am so glad we had this conversation. <laughs> And she did, and she kept the project alive for the next five years. Uh, so the recent approval from the FAA suggests that we probably made the right decision. Uh, so all the way back to 2012, this is uh, for those of you that speak FAA speak. Uh, this block right here 
uh, is the FAA sign off approving the specification for G100 UL? Yeah, it was nine years ago. Uh, so that got done in the spring of 12. Without that specification, we couldn't start any testing for credit. And so we got that done and we went to work testing. So this doc, this particular photograph that I showed you earlier documents the rather intense high level of FAA involvement, direct involvement in our project. Dick, you may remember that Aerostar did most of its certification work directly with the FAA without using DERs. Do I recall that correctly? Did you? Okay, I, then I, mis, I misremembered that. So, uh, like I say, this was a, a very hot day, uh, September 5th, 2012. And on that day, we successfully finished all of the Part 23 airframe flight testing quali to qualify the G100 UL unleaded AVGAS for a high compression turbocharged engine. We, part of the test plan, we flew the airplane to 25,000 feet on 100 low lead that had been tested on the ramp to have a vapor pressure at the upper end of the 7.1 spec. Uh, had to shut the engine down by turning the fuel valve from on to off, let the airplane glide down in a block airspace to 16,000 and turn the fuel valve on and make sure it would restart on its own. We landed, filled the airplane up with G100 UL and did a rinse, wash and repeat. Uh, did some uh, other operability tests, logged all of that data. Now here's, what you need to appreciate. There were four highly experienced FAA engineers on site, personally, in Ada, Oklahoma, for God's sakes. This is Pete Rouse. He uh, was out of Air 21 at the Kansas City uh, uh, Small Airplane Directorate. This is running buddy Mark Orr, who was the senior fuels guy at the Small Airplane Directorate. This is Kevin Brain uh, out of the uh, fuel office in Atlanta. Uh, one of the truly good guys in this whole saga. If it hadn't been for Kevin, I don't think I'd be standing here today. And this is Jurgen Priester, another one of the truly FAA good guys out of the Fort Worth Aircraft Certification Office. Yeah, there's four of them standing there making sure we get this right. So what we're doing, that white thing you see right there, yeah, that's a uh, recent acquisition hot water tank from uh, Home Depot. And we cut the top out of it, and it's got a bunch of hot water in it. And then uh, there's a copper coil. It looks like a stiller's coil inside. And we're circulating the fuel through the hot water to get the fuel up to 105 degrees before we put it in the wings. And the wings have been preheated with electric blankets to get them up to 100 and plus degrees so that we could go do this hot day, hot fuel testing to satisfy the FAA. We landed, they evaluated all the data on the spot uh, before they left. And we passed, that is the first, and to my knowledge, the only time that has ever been successfully done on a uh, octane unleaded AVGAS in a high compression engine with turbochargers. So then the other big issue on the front end is material compatibility. You know, you can't put it in the tank and have it to, uh, you know, turn the, the rubber tank to mush like the, the shell fuel did that went into the PAPI program. Uh, and so, uh, actually, Kevin Brain, the guy, the good, the good guy, FAA guy that I mentioned, came up with the idea of doing this kind of a rig test. This is kind of fun. Um, so, up here on top is three field ladders. One of those is a 1954 brand new ladder out of the box for a T-34. Never been out of the box. One of them is a 15 or 20 year old ladder out of the wing tank of the Sally Jarred out of Barron. Frankly, I've forgotten what the third one is. Then you got all this stuff down here, which is this stuff down here, that includes a lactoming fuel pump, a continental fuel pump, and almost every wetted component you can imagine that's located in any airplane you can imagine, all rigged up in series. And the fuel pumps, the engine fuel pumps have got electric heaters on them, they hit them up to 150 degrees. And uh, we ran that rig, started out, ran it for a few days on 100 low lead, drained it, switched it to G100 UL, ran it for seven or eight months, run it during the day, let it sit overnight, fire it up, start it again. Uh, and then when we got through, as part of the test plan, we drained the G100 UL out, put 100 low lead back in there to make sure something didn't start to leak when we switched back. Uh, 
And we pretty much covered the entire spectrum uh, in that investigation uh, as to things that uh, uh, might just demonstrate uh, anomalous problems as a result of the different fuel chemistry. Put my clicker away. And this sheet up here is the FAA approval of all that material compatibility testing. The uh, fuel that you see on the left is a G100 UL uh, fuel chemistry. The fuel on the right is FBO100 low lead, and this is a 50 50 mixture of the two together. You've got pass outs back there that have got those pictures there. So the center one goes to green. Yeah, the, well, you, what happens if in art class if you mix blue and yellow? <laughs> Mrs. Turley in the fourth grade taught me that. <laughs> so this is the uh, engine control room uh, at GAMI. How many of you people in here have been to an APS class at one time? Okay, a few of you. Well, then, we've all been, many of us have been down to see you. Well, that's true. Ago. You all came there one time. That's right. Ten years ago. So we started building this in 1999. It has evolved over time. It is without a doubt the single most capable aircraft piston engine test facility in the world. The only one close to it is the one the FAA has at the Atlantic City Test Center. It can do some things we can't do, but we don't need to do and it uh, fails to be able to do a number of things we do that it needs to do. Uh, there's like five different computers. All of that software is in-house coding. You get anybody in here in software, you under, start to appreciate the magnitude. Yeah, all of the, uh, all of the software that's driving those computer screens is coded in-house. Uh, it's all custom coded software. Uh, people that are familiar with software can start to begin to appreciate the magnitude of that task. So I'm going to run through these real quick, but this is data. Okay, that's fine. I'll do it this way. So, uh, this plot up here is data from December 16th of last year. The FAA was sitting next to me in that engine test cell uh, on person, and we're doing detonation testing. So what's kind of unique about this, you see all these little dots in that dot scattered that pattern. Each dot represents a single combustion event. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. This is about 15 seconds from here to here. The mixture is being leaned, and the engine is set up so that as we lean the mixture, it passes through that area of fuel ratios that is known to provide the most intense level of uh, potential detonation. And so as this is going on, the computer calculates the intensity of the detonation using an approved algorithm for each combustion event, and they get plotted in that scatter plot. Now, one of, there's three fuels up there. One of them is a min-spec minimum octane 100 low lead, and the other two are two different uh, unleaded G100 UL uh, fuel chemistries uh, that are also uh, conformed at the laboratory to be the bottom end of the minimum of the spec range for octane. So, you know, is this one worse than this one? Absolutely. Is it worse than this one? Yeah. Is this one worse than this one? Yes. Uh, same over here, probably, probably, and clearly. Now, that's a quick and dirty visual uh, evaluation, but what you really hope is that this is 100 low lead and these are unleaded versions, right? That's what we want to see, folks, right? Men spec ASTM D910 100 low lead, men spec. Gammy in one version, MinSpec Gammy in another version. 
second run for repeat, same result. Clearly, we were able to demonstrate that each of the two unleaded AVGAS formulations performed better than a similar uh, ASTM D100 on that set of tests. About 3.30 in the afternoon, we completed on December 16th all of the tests on our uh, spreadsheet of about 28 line items. FAA guy sitting next to me, he looks over and said, George, I think we're done. I said, well, let's compare lists. So we did. Sure enough, we all checked off the same boxes. He said, so we're done? And I said, well, maybe. But, and that was Kevin Marks from the Wichita Aircraft Certification. He had to get exemptions from Washington for COVID to be there in person. God bless him. And God bless Earl Lawrence that made it happen. And so after we uh, uh, reviewed the list, we agreed we were done. And then the following dialogue took place. I said, you know, Kevin, there's one optional item that we didn't have to do, but that we could do if we demonstrated we'd passed all the other tests. And he looked at me like I'd lost my mind. He said, are you sure, George? I said, you know, Kevin, uh, the, the, the idea was to just sit there and start cranking up the manifold pressure and see how far we could go before we destroyed the engine doing a detonation test on G100UL. See how much power we could make, what the, what the boundary condition. Uh, he looked at me like I lost my mind. And I said, you know, Kevin, the engine is conformed. The data acquisition is conformed. The instrumentation is calibrated and conformed. The fuel is conformed. The FAA is here. Is there ever going to be a better time? He said, George, it's your call. So we went to work. And uh, we sat there. We had been running the engine in order to get it to detonate at about 34 inches. This is an engine that's got a red line of 30 inches. And all the CHTs were up at red line. The oil temperatures at red line. The induction air temperature was way the hell past red line. Uh, and so uh, we said, well, instead of 33 or 34, and I turned around to my girl, Lorelei, who's a whiz, and she was running the computer that runs the, waste, the electronic controller on the wastegate. Yeah, there are those things. I flew one of them up here today. Uh, and we cranked it up to 37 inches, repeated those same tests you saw before, cranked it up to 39 inches, did it again without problem. Uh, and uh, the FAA guy thought I'd lost my living mind. I turned around to Laura and I said, Laura, give me 42 inches of manifold pressure. And we're talking 42 inches on an 8.7 to 1 engine that's rated at 30. And she looks at me and says, okay, and she plays with it. And I look at it and I said, Lorelai, I don't see 42. All I see is 41.4. Give me 42. She points up at the computer screen and starts tapping on it. There's this little round dial and it's the position of the wastegate. And the wastegate is fully closed. There ain't no more to be had. So we ran the test at 41.4 inches. Not only was there no uh, uh, incipient detonation there was and certainly no limiting detonation there was no detectable detonation of any kind whatsoever now this is a full power full rich test it's the same sort of test they do for full power on a big radial engine uh, and so we had to declare defeat and victory at the same time and press on. So here's the data from when we were doing that last run. You'll notice 41.4 inches right up here. And the CHT was 450, red lines 460 on that engine. And the engine was making 133% of its rated power as brake horsepower up here at 380 horsepower. That's a 310 horsepower engine. But that's not corrected to standard day because the temperatures are up and the induction air temperature, which is in here someplace, uh, is up around uh, 150 or so, uh, four, uh, right there, 153. 
So if you correct all that to standard day, the gross corrected horsepower is 414. You could pass a detonation test on this engine rated at 414 and 41 plus inches of manifold pressure. I keep this coffee cup in our engine test cell. I invite you to read it. I find it somewhat reassuring. So I come in and, and Peter Bunce at Gamma and a bunch of the other naysayers have been going around without having any knowledge of the matter whatsoever saying, yeah, but you know, uh, they, they haven't done this on a Lycoming engine. They don't have any detonation data for these uh, big bore engines. and They don't know a clue what they're talking about. But this is the approved document from the FAA and with a very partial list there's a TSO 550A, I believe that's a 360 horsepower Continental engine. TSO 550B 350, TSO 550K, which is on the Turbo Cirrus, and a Lycoming IO 540K, and a TIO 540A E2A, that's the uh, uh, Mirage engine on the uh, uh, Malibu Mirage, uh, and a TIO 540J2BD that's on the Navajo Chieftain. All those engines were covered by that detonation testing. The engine that we used in the configuration that we ran it at the elevated manifold pressure and temperatures has a higher appetite, now listen carefully, has a higher appetite for octane than any other engine operating at its standard operating conditions known to exist in the fleet of general aviation engines. We did it with a worst case engine. And the FAA has blessed it. Summary, these are tests that we have done successfully that have been approved by the FAA. Material compatibility, high altitude operation, high altitude restarts, hot day, hot field climate operational testing, performance testing, same, same. 150 hour part 33 engine block test on an aircraft uh, along with 170 hours of real-world functionality and reliability testing. Uh, and then we finished the detonation testing last December 15th and 16th. Uh, all of this testing was not done by us. That was done by Emory Riddle using their engineers, their pilots, their equipment with the FAA driving down from Mobile, strike that from Atlanta uh, on a weekly basis to supervise. And while they were doing this test, independently of anything we were doing, we never set foot in the state of Florida. And when somebody says, well, you know, nobody's had any input and any supervision of this work, and Gammy's done all this in secret. Nonsense. BS. And all that data is now approved by the FAA. And lo and behold, on the 23rd day of July, the manager of the Wichita Aircraft Certification Office signed the initial STCs. Boy, the flight manual supplement's really complicated. Yeah, you gotta put placards on. Basically all the normal procedures say, don't change anything you're already doing, keep doing everything you're already doing, uh, and go on with life and, and uh, go out and be happy. It's really simple. It's six physical pages and about four pages of stuff. So here's some problems this field does not have. It does not have lead or metallic deposits. Uh, and flight test engine that had uh, 170 hours on it was had been flown 400 hours on leaded fuel before it was in. Uh, two cylinders were changed to virgin cylinders and two were kept. Then it was flown another 170 hours on G100. And all four of those cylinders, I'll show you one of them in a minute, were pristine when we got through. Uh, it does not have any compatibility problems with engine and fuel wetted components. It's completely fungible with 100 low lead. It does not have cold weather starting and operational problems. The swift fuel they tested down at Emory Riddle, they couldn't get it started in the wintertime in Florida. In Florida, for God's sakes. They had to rewrite the POH to teach people a different way of starting the engine to get it started on swift fuel in Florida in December in Florida. Did I mention Florida? So what's our plan for deploying this stuff? As I mentioned, Avfuel came to us 
they have agreed to manage the vetting and qualification and logistics of the blenders uh, to get this stuff made and delivered. Uh, so we're on a campaign right now with everybody and their dog and the senior levels of the FAA, including their newly formed division for P and I stands for, you know, it's an FAA acronym, policy and innovation to come up with a better way to distribute the STCs. So you notice anything unusual about these placards? Speak up. Somebody said it. QR codes. You know, the 21st century. So the idea would be, is what I call the Ogden, Utah problem. Somebody's flying their airplane from Idaho to Nevada, and uh, they get to, they're, they're, they're conscientious. They don't have a G100 ULSTC, uh, but they plan their right. Well, they run into weather, and they have to divert, and they land at an airport, call it Ogden, Utah, that only has G100 UL and no 100 low lead. Well, they're stranded unless they can get the STC. So the idea is to figure out a quick and easy way for them to do that, and the idea is for them, for us to preposition the STC packages at the FBOs and for them to be able to go up the counter and say, okay, you know, I screwed up. I need a G100 UL STC. What can you do to help me? He uh, takes their name and number and their credit card. Uh, he hands them this package. They open it up and they scan the QR code. It brings up a screen on their uh, iPhone. They fill out the form on the iPhone. It associates the end number of the airplane with that particular QR code that's serialized. And uh, uh, he gets a, a ding dong that blesses his activity. Uh, he goes out and he puts the placards on the wing and he's good to go. That simple. Why should it be more complicated? And then five years later, if there's some FISDO guy that's walking the ramp trying to ding somebody and he comes up and he sees one of these placards on the wing and he says, you know, I wonder if that's legitimate. He can take his phone, scan that QR code, and it will bring up a message that says that QR code is assigned to November 316 on November. He looks at the tail and he sees that's the number on the tail. He smiles and goes on about his evil ways. So, follow me through. GAMI's got patents and certification and quality control. The fuel chemistry is uh, uh, for a very useful octane enhancer is made by this company in Germany. Yeah. One of the most frequent comments that we've had is we don't have any SMEs working on our projects. Anybody know what an SME is? Subject matter expert, my God. Well, I want to tell you a story about this. These people came to see us in 2013, 14. And they said, you know, we noticed from some of the literature that you're probably using one of the molecules that we make at our plant on the Rhine River in Germany. And we make about half of all that that's made in the world and we want to be part of this project. Well, the guy I was talking to has a PhD in organic chemistry from 25 years ago from a little university called Berkeley. Come on, folks. That was back when Berkeley was really Berkeley. <laughs> Lancis, nobody's ever heard of them, but they were spun off from a parent company about 12, 14 years ago. And... Of course, nobody's ever heard of the parent company either. It's a little company in Germany called Bayer. Really big outfit, uh, located fortuitously about four blocks away from the headquarters for IASA in, in uh, Cologne. Uh, so this facility produces about 100 million gallons, or, or actually it produced quite a bit more than that, but we will source about 100 million gallons of a very high-grade aviation alkalate that goes in the fuel, and then AFFUEL is going to handle the logistics of all this. You put those four things together, and we think we can make 160, 200 million gallons of high-octane unleaded AVE gas for the industry, uh, and our annual consumption right now is somewhere between 160 and 180.
Some of you will appreciate this greatly because there's been a lot of adverse comments. Well, Gammy is going to corner the market and they're going to charge the hell out of us for all this stuff. Well, when Craig Sincock, the president of Avfield, started that business, he had to be able to, to get an FBO located in an airport. He had to be able to supply both jet fuel and Avgas. Well, Phillips and Shell and British Petroleum and Exxon Mobil, uh, all those players went to work to shut him out of any source of Avgas. Jet fuel, anybody makes jet fuel. You can get jet fuel from anywhere. But Avgas was very limited, and they did everything they could to kill his business by keeping him from being able to acquire 100 low lead from any source. And he spent about 10 years of his life fighting that problem. And his comment to me is, that ain't ever going to happen to anybody again. Hence, we came up with this concept of something similar to open software, and that is that any qualified blender is going to be allowed to blend the fuel. they got to meet a rigorous set of qualifications, but if they do that on a completely uh, uh, non-discriminatory basis, they're going to be allowed to make the fuel. Furthermore, any FBO is going to be able and allowed to buy the fuel on a non-discriminatory basis from the nearest source, the nearest available source that has fuel in their tanks so that we get away from this business of transporting uh, 100 low lead 1,000 miles across country and driving by two refineries that make it that are only 100 miles away from the FBO. That's just absurd. And it raises the cost due to the transportation costs. So that's built into this concept of open software. Uh, in this case, uh, translated into the production of G100UL. We've got two remaining, two, the, the initial STCs were limited to a small number of airplanes on the AML. Uh, the FAA's paradigm for this is, George, we want to get you pregnant before Oshkosh because it's politically sensitive, and then let's see what happens in nine months. I could appreciate that. Um, the guys that are working our project now have been superb. They've been the best set of FAA engineers I've ever worked with in my life in the last 25 years. Uh, and there's a good story, a good story with that. Uh, so, uh, we agreed that, uh, and actually we agreed to do this five years ago when we shouldn't have agreed to do it, but we agreed to do it. So we're going to do it. So we've got one more 150 hour test run, which is why you saw that fuel going into that big white tank on the first slide. Uh, and that engine's being made by Bill Cunningham as I stand here and talk, uh, to finish that test. And then we've got to do one perfunctory flight test on a friggin', excuse my French, uh, PA-32 Piper Lance with an IO-540K. Uh, the, that airplane's conformed, the fuel's conformed. The FAA has delegated the flight testing to me as a flight test DER. Uh, so that's imminent. And by the way, they're all almost identical to tests we've already successfully done at least once, typically twice in the past already. So here's some breaking news for you. Right after we got those limited, hey, George, you're pregnant, short list of engines and airframes, uh, literally the second Tuesday after Oshkosh, we have a, we've had a scheduled Zoom call with the FAA every Tuesday since the first week in August of a year ago. And the only, the only Tuesday or time we've missed having it on at least a weekly basis has been Christmas. And it's been enormously productive. The calls are scheduled. They may last 30 minutes or an hour. They may last three hours, whatever the, the need is. And so our cycle time for turning, Dick, we write a report or a test plan. It goes to the FAA on Wednesday or Thursday. They review it on Friday and Monday, send it back to us, and it comes up on the screen on Tuesday. And if there's any issues with it, we fix it on the spot. Uh, otherwise, they tell us to put it in final form and they'll... Uh, and send them an 8110 uh, and they'll sign it. And our cycle time was typically one week on every, every document, every test plan, every test report, all the way through there. Even, you know, with, COVID going on. even with COVID going on. Uh, COVID, in a way, made it easier because they were all working from home. Okay. Zoom was a marvelous thing. Uh, so they call us, or uh, we get on the Zoom call on Tuesday you know, right after Oshkosh, and they say, George, now listen, the, the crisis in Santa Clara County had already started to bubble to the surface. And the FAA, in spite of what you may think, 
typically does not live in a vacuum. In a particular, Earl Lawrence, who used to work at EAA before he went to the FAA, does not live in a vacuum. Earl Lawrence is now Air One, sits in the corner office in Washington, where Dorinda Baker that I mentioned before used to sit. They're not oblivious to the political climate. And so to back up a step in early July, a year ago, I had breakfast with the president of AOPA, Mark Baker, at a little airport in Tarkio, Missouri, hometown of Congressman Sam Graves, who's the ranking Republican on the House Budget Committee. He has a little air show there the first uh, Saturday, Friday, Saturday after the 4th of July. And uh, Mark was going there. I made arrangements to go have breakfast with him on Saturday morning. It was supposed to be a one hour breakfast. We're at breakfast for three and a half hours. He wants to know everything about the fuel project. At the end of that, he says, George, what can I do to help? I said, the guys that are working our project right now are trying to kill it. And I can prove it objectively. Uh, and he says, so what do you need? I said, I need you to pick up the phone and call Earl Lawrence and get Earl Lawrence to look at the project file and find a solution to the uh, obstruction that's going on. I said, Mark, keep in mind, you can't tell me who's going to win this election next November. And if things go one way, we could have a new administrator of the EPA in March of 2021, and we could have a ban on Hunter Lowlad by Christmas. And I said, your organization, AOPA, is going to catch an intense amount of flack from its members if you don't do everything you can to find a solution between now and then. He was suitably motivated. So, uh, a week later, I got a phone call from Air One, from Earl Lawrence. George, this Earl. Oh, Earl, yeah, good to hear from you. He says, George, I've been looking at your project file. There's been way too much regulatory activity, not near enough certification activity. This project's taken five years too long. I said, yeah, you got that right, Earl. He says, tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna reassign all the people that have been doing nothing on your project and let them go do nothing someplace else. I'm not kidding. And I'm going to put a whole new team in charge. And I expect to see conspicuous progress. You got any questions? Yeah. I said, Earl, it'll take me two months to educate those guys on the project history. I mean, there's, you know, there's 15 banker boxes of documents. He said, they're quick learners. <laughs> so 10 days later, I get a phone call from Wichita, got a whole new team. These guys are both people that came out of industry with 10 or 15 years experience working for Cessna and Beechcraft. They know the subject matter from the outside looking in and they know it from the inside looking out. And they said, well, give us a week to read the file and we'll get started. A week later, they called me up and said, oh, uh, would you mind doing a series of PowerPoints and bringing us up to speed on the project? This is bigger than we thought. So every Tuesday, starting the first Tuesday in August of last year, through the second Tuesday in September, I spent the whole week doing PowerPoints and we spent three hours on a Zoom call on Tuesday afternoon. And at the end of the second Tuesday in September, they looked at the screen at me and said, George, I think we've come to the end of this. Do you agree? And I said, yep, that's the last one I've got. They said, good, let's go to work and get some certification done. And nine months later, the first SDCs got signed. It's the way the regulatory agencies should work. Breaking news. They get on the phone with us. So George, we've looked at your certification file and we now realize that uh, you need, you're actually more pregnant than we thought you were. <laughs> because the data package that's already approved actually supports coverage for all of the existing engines and airframes in the fleet that presently are qualified to use 94 UL 91, AD 87, or MoGas, which is about 50 or 60% of the fleet in terms of numbers, not fuel consumption, but numbers. Said, uh, won't you write us a new uh, uh, CERT plan, a new compliance checklist, uh, and get together and generate an amended AML as fast as you can, and we will approve it uh, and get it done. Last Friday morning, after an exchange of four emails between eight o'clock and 10 o'clock on Friday morning, back and forth between me and the Wichita guys, we sent them in the last document that was required in order to accomplish that. 
And I'm expecting those STC, those amended approved model lists with literally hundreds, hundreds, 250, 350, 450, I don't, can't even count them, uh, additional engines to get added to uh, the days of our pregnancy. Thereafter, the final fleet-wide expansion, I think, is going to happen before the end of Q2, maybe sooner. Anybody in here know John Deacon? Heard of him. That's John Deacon in the cockpit. That was his favorite airplane of all time. Time for questions. Questions. Okay, I'm going to start here, go to you, and then I'll go back to you. Yes, sir? Speak. Pardon? Estimated cost. Always the first question. It's the right question. Um, it's going to be more expensive than 100 low lead. Our present calculations, when we sit down and just evaluate the cost of the raw materials and compare them to the cost of the raw materials that's in a gallon of 100 low lead, what we're seeing are numbers that are in the neighborhood of somewhere between, on the low side, 50 cents, and on the high side, 90 cents to a dollar more than the gallon of 100 low lead. It's somewhere in there. I can't tell you where. And a lot of it's going to depend on how much more that people tack onto it uh, as margins. But it ain't $12 a gallon, and it's not $3 a gallon more, unless some FBO decides to rape everybody. Next question. Yes, George, thank you. Um, light, the way you indicated earlier that there would be efficiencies from open sourcing, because since there's light coming out of it, might there be, with economies and adoption over time, that those cost increases coming down? Or is the uh, raw material component that much more expensive? So the answer is yes, the cost could well come down because, for example, Right now, a truck carrying 100 low lead has to be a dedicated truck. Otherwise, when you get to the end of the line and you want to put something else in it, you got to go through and clean it out, get a certificate that it's been cleaned and it's no longer full of hazmat. This fuel is sufficiently similar to other fuels in terms of fuel chemistry uh, that uh, you're not going to have to do that sort of thing. So there's some really potential benefits. None of this fuel is ever going to go through a pipeline because the, the lost wastage at the beginning and end of the pigs on the pipeline and the volumes are so low that that's not ever going to happen. But it sure as the devil can go by rail, and the cleanup process on a rail car when they turn it around is completely minimal compared to what it is with Hunter Uh Does that answer your question? Yes. So it was somebody up front. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, is the base fuel we're using automotive gas? The answer is absolutely not. Okay. Uh, however, uh, that 100 million gallons that I mentioned up there, that is a, a, uh, a series of fuel molecules that's quite familiar to anybody that's ever made AVE gas. It's just a much higher quality with a much fewer set of, of, uh, of inappropriate molecules in the final production run. That answer your question, sir. Behind you with the microphone. Um, I, I watched your EAA presentation on YouTube. You talked some in detail. Maybe you're going to get to that about some of the benefits to the engine. With yes. So the question is: Is are there going to be any offsetting benefits? Let me show you. That's one of the cylinders from ERA ERA use. Uh, run in Florida. A cylinder had 400 hours on lead and then uh, we turned around and ran it another 170 hours on G100 UL. If any of you guys are maintenance shop guys that do overhauls or anything like that, the typical reaction that I have gotten from people like Bill Cunningham uh, when they look at that picture they go, oh wow yeah. it's clean folks. There ain't any evidence of lead deposit sludge or anything like that in that cylinder. Uh, I'm not sure whether I do here or not, but it's also pristine. Uh, 
So we anticipate that ultimately we're probably going to be able to get some TBO extensions. The, we've got a friend that used to be deeply involved in the Porsche race car world. Think six cylinder horizontally opposed air cooled engines. And he said when they went from leaded to unleaded fuel, that their TBO on the racetrack on those engines doubled. Yeah, nice. Uh, we're gonna be able to go to synthetic motor oil. We can see oil change intervals that go from 25 to 35 hours now. Or something better than mobile one. I ran mobile one for 1400 hours in my turbo normalized Bonanza. Uh, from new to 1,400 hours when Mobile One got pulled. Uh, they wanted me to tear it down, and so we tore it down. I had been running it in cruise with lean mixtures from day one. We tore it down. The inside of the engine was pristinely clean, in spite of the fact that everybody out there that was running with rich mixtures on Mobile One had sludge everywhere. So, yeah, we can, we can use... Uh, uh, a synthetic motor oil, it needs to be probably a little different chemistry than Mobile One. And Ed Collins and I are already working on that. Uh, without the metallic deposits, uh, then the synthetic motor oils are going to work. So here's a nice picture. This one on the left, that is a candidate fuel that went to PAFI from one of those major oil companies that back in the 1930s put a lot of gasoline stations on the mother road. I didn't say that. And all this red stuff, yeah, that's their metallic octane enhancer. And that cylinder failed at about 40 hours into a test at the FAA Tech Center. Yeah, it works, folks. There's a bunch of frequently asked questions. Those are actually incorporated into that much larger list that uh, is in the pass outs at the back. And those cards are on that stack. Uh, you can go to that QR code. It'll take you to the information website at AvFuel. And they've got a bunch of these PowerPoints and a bunch of this information if you want to dig into this deeper. Um, that's some more of that detonation data. I'm not going to get into the middle of it. And I think that's the end of this. So let me back up to yeah, that won't let me go back to the beginning. All right, I'm going to leave all that stuff up there. More questions? Yes, sir. If you'll speak loud enough, I'll repeat it. Challenging to ask on Maria's slide to read the bill for your answer. Well, first off, uh, George, congratulations. This is a long fought effort and just the right time. <laughs> so, so you are the hero of the hour, especially if the uh, rebuild view issue uh, takes fire like it looks like it will. The question then, with all of the confidence that you should have, um, given the, the swift, uh, that's the wrong word in this room, the, <laughs> the quick progress of, uh, of the FAA and what you're saying about Q1 and Q2 uh, likelihood for the fleet wide, um, what are what are our fuels plans for scaling and rolling this out? So when when could you give us a sense of we might see this in the out fuel network and a little sense of what that rollout plan? I got an email at 1.15 this morning. Yeah, I work strange hours. From that PhD Berkeley graduate I mentioned in Germany. Said, George, just a heads up, uh, Lance has just authorized me to spend a million dollars to uh, give to the European version of our EPA so that they will clear them to ship that octane enhancer from Germany. That's a pretty serious commitment. He said, I thought you ought to know that you might sleep better. My response was, yes, sir. 
he has ISO containers of that octane enhancer that are on the ocean right now, headed to Houston and to the East Coast. Uh, I'm supposed to make a trip with Avfield to Houston to a very well-established long-term uh, company down there that blends specialty fuels. And the idea is to get them to make a first batch of 100 or 200,000 gallons, to put it in rail cars, ship it to Bakersfield, California. We think, but don't yet have confirmation that there are some unused storage tanks there. It's fairly centrally located in California. The flight school at Bakersfield, California Aeronautical University has a large fleet of airplanes that are already covered on our STC. They are pretty excited about getting this done. Last week, I was contacted by uh, the folks at Reed Hillview, and they are trying to schedule me for a Zoom call with the uh, county supervisor that uh, 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 made the motion to ban 100 low lead, which was adopted and approved. If you all haven't heard this news, the county of Santa Clara County has voted that 100 low lead will not be sold on any of the airports in Santa Clara County starting January 1st, three months from now. We're less than 100 days away, folks. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Okay? And so, you know, I don't know how that conversation is going to go because uh, she is. Uh, of the particular environmental persuasion that, uh, you know, what have you guys been doing? You've been taking way the heck too long to get this done, la di da di da di da Well, by God, she's right. But she's wrong to be uh, pugnacious about it, given the potential for early success. Uh, did I answer your question? Very much so. Anybody else over here? And back to you. Hopefully, if we get, yeah, the question was, if I land at an airport, don't have the FTC, and the only fuel there, the only high octane fuel that's there is uh, the G100 unleaded Avgas, uh, I'm stuck unless I can get the STC. Oh, well, the process I mentioned a minute ago with the QR codes is going to be your salvation. Well... Um, literally, pardon? It's this one right there. There you go. No, that's the wrong one. There we go. Thank you. So hopefully we're going to get the FAA to think like they're in the 21st century. Uh, I mean, this, this is a real serious problem. You, know, you have identified a very serious problem. And, but this QR stuff is so quirky and so techy that it actually rings a positive bell with some of the people in the FAA about, oh, we're going to be able to brag about how good we are, how, you know, state of the art we are. I mean, there's a certain, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Somebody find the right to, the right to language for me. But uh, the idea would be that you go to the FBO, that we have prepositioned these packages under there. Uh, the QR codes are all serialized. And so you buy the package. Hand him your credit card, get the STCs. If you're asking how much they cost, think about what the Peterson STCs cost. They're going to be in the same neighborhood. Uh, and you take that package, get your phone out, scan that QR code, fill out the form. It then ties your in number to that QR code in our computer. And you take those placards, they're stick-on placards. You know, we let pilots change the oil. We let pilots clean and remove the spark plugs. Do you think maybe they can put a sticky on a wing? Maybe? Nope. Okay, so, so is that the ultimate 
thing that we have to do is just put a sticker on the wing. You got to, you got to, you got to scan it with your phone, uh, fill out the information. It'll come back and authorize it. You go out, put it on the wing, and you should be good to fly away with the fuel. Okay, now if I want to do that today, can I? No. When will I be able to do that? When the fleet wide STCs are available. Uh, hopefully before Q2 of next year. Okay, and when that happens, will I need to go to an FBA that, FBO that has the fuel, or will I be able to go online like, in a pro proactive way and get all the stickers? And yeah, you can you can do that uh, without having to go to the FBO. Okay, so once it's approved, then yeah. all I got to do is. I mean, you, you go online and we'll, you know we'll mail you the the placard package and and you know you'll get it the next day and you know FedEx does its job or whatever UPS. And uh, you, when you get it, you can do the same thing. If you haven't already done it online, you can scan the QR code and walk out to your airplane, put it on there, uh, and hopefully you're done, done, done. Okay. So we don't need to wait for an FBO that has it. No, no, no. You would not have to. Yes. No. Uh, this doesn't take away your ability to use Hunter Low Lit. Okay. This goes on in addition to the existing placards or stickers that you have that says 100 low lit. It just authorizes still an additional fuel. Good question, by the way. All right, in the far back, be loud. Any changes involving the what? No. Well, actually, a good one. Uh, early on in 2010, I got a phone call one day from Alan Klatmeyer. Cirrus Allen Klepmeyer. He said, George, I'm going to be down to your part of the world. I want to fly this fuel. And I said, well, Alan, the only other outsider that's flown this fuel so far is Senator Inhofe. He said, well, if you let him do it, you need to let me do it. Okay. <laughs> so he shows up in Ada, and we get in the airplane, and we've got G100 in, in the left wing and, and 100 low lead in the right wing. And we get up, and... And Alan's a performance guy, you know, and he knows his numbers. And uh, he knows his turbo normalized Cirruses. And so he gets it all set up, gets the autopilot on. We're in smooth air, about 11, 12, 13,000 feet. And uh, he's sitting there watching it, and he's got it leaned out, Lena Peak, and it's uh, burning 17 gallons an hour on 100 OLED. And so he says, okay, let's switch. So he switches to G100UL, tweaks the mixture so it's sitting on 17.0 gallons per hour. And he sits there, crosses his arm, says, I want to see what happens in the next five minutes. George, am I crazy? We're not half, two and a half knots faster. Well, yeah, Alan. No, you're not crazy. Well, hey, how can that be? We're at the same fuel flow. I said, well, switch it back to 100 low lead and see what happens. Switches it back, sits there, waits about three minutes. He said, George, we just lost a knot and a half to two knots. What the F is going on? I said, well, try it again and convince yourself it's real. So he does, and it's real. And he says, well, so what's going on? I said, okay, now you're a knot and a half, two knots faster. Take the fuel flow and adjust it from 17.0 down to 16.7. He does it. He said, well, now it's going the same speed as it was on 100 low lit. I'm burning three-tenths of a gallon an hour less. I said, precisely. He says, how can that be? I said, because when you're running with a lean mixture, the horsepower is a function of the energy content of the fuel. And on a volumetric basis, this fuel has slightly higher energy per gallon than 100 low lead. But if you tweak it down by three tenths of one gallon, the energy content going to the engine every minute or every hour is exactly the same as it is at 100 low lead at 17 gallons an hour. Oh, okay. So that's, you know, look, we're talking about differences that are so small as to be negligible. But if, if you have to ask me if there's a difference, the answer, the true answer is, yeah, but it's so small that you got to be Alan Klatmeyer to figure it out. Did I answer your question? Yes, or very slightly cooler, according to that 
September 5th, 2012, hot day climbed to 25,000 feet. And I say very slightly, we're talking four, five, six, seven degrees F. Hard to measure reliably, repeatedly. Other questions? All right, you were next. We have an alternative international source for that. There used to be, Dow Chemical used to make it. They don't currently. I think they could again. Okay. It's concerned with the shipping way it's found in hotness in the world these days. Yep. Uh, I understand. That's the reason to get a nice stockpile of it over here. In the back in the middle. Uh, frankly, we haven't nailed that down, but let me tell you what we're thinking about. Uh, the, you know, the, the Peterson has kind of set the paradigm. He charges for the airframe and then a separate charge for each engine. Okay. But the engines are priced by horsepower. Okay. The airframe is a fixed. That, I think that would probably, I think that would cover it. Okay. One last question, somebody? What's the weight? Ah, very good question. The fuel typically weighs around 6.25 pounds per gallon. 100 low lead, depending on who makes it, uh, weighs somewhere between 5.9 and 6.1. All right, one question and then we're done, done, done. No. That works for me. George, thank you so much. Appreciate it, everybody.